Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and on behalf of all the Marian Fathers and all of us here at EWTN, welcome back to Living Divine Mercy. With the Feast of Divine Mercy coming up this Sunday, we believe there is nothing more important you can ever do than to receive the grace Jesus promises us on that day. Why? Because Jesus said the last hope of salvation is the feast of his mercy. Wow, it sounds like we should listen and do what he says. But what exactly does that entail? We are Okay, let's start with when Divine Mercy Sunday is. Now, most of you know that it's the Sunday after Easter. But why did Jesus say it has to be on this day? He said that because it completes what we call an octave. You see, for the Jews, when a feast was so big that it could not be celebrated in one day, they would celebrate it over eight days and call it an octave. And the biggest octave we have in the church is called the Easter octave, which starts on Easter Sunday and ends eight days later on Divine Mercy Sunday. But why eight days? Isn't seven the perfect number for the Jews? Yes, but it's the perfect number in regards to time or creation. The number eight represents eternity to the Jews. So after Jesus opened the doors to heaven on Easter Sunday, the next seven days are symbolic of our pilgrimage here on earth called life, being in time. And like the Jews wandering around the desert to find the promised land, we in our life are wandering around in this valley of tears to find the promised land of heaven, which again Jesus opened the doors to on Easter Sunday. So why is all this important? Because when our pilgrimage on earth is over and we enter into eternity on the eighth day, Jesus comes for us. How does he do that, though? Well, the church fathers always described it as being like a wedding. Jesus is the groom, and he comes for his bride, which is us, the church. And he wants to take us home to heaven to meet his mother and his father. But like any good Jewish man, he wants his bride, us, to be spotless before he can take us home. And since Jesus is the groom and we the church are the bride, as we said, when you're at Mass and you make your procession up the aisle to receive Holy Communion, it's like you are making your wedding march. And who is waiting for you there at the altar? Jesus the groom. And what happens? It's consummated. The groom enters in to you, the bride, and the two become one. But before we can do that, before Jesus comes for his bride to take us home to heaven, we need to be spotless, as we said, having no stains on our wedding garment, which is our soul. The two stains that must be removed are the sin itself that we've committed and then any temporal punishment that we are still owed, even if our sins have been forgiven. Yes, unfortunately, our sins have consequences, even after being forgiven. And in the confessional, while our eternal punishment for sin, aka hell, is completely gone, wiped away, the temporal punishment, aka purgatory, may still remain even after confession. That is why purgatory exists. It's not for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus already did that. It's to remove any attachments we may still have to this world and to prepare us for only being attached to God in heaven. So, how do we cleanse ourselves of these stains before Jesus comes on the eighth day at the end of our life? Well, there are a few ways. 
One of the ways the church gives is a plenary indulgence. But the problem with that is you can have no attachment to sin, even venial. And as I always say, good luck with that one, because some of us, most of us, still have some form of attachments. For me, being impatient or gluttonous, for example. So it's difficult. When Jesus comes, though, he's not then going to find too many of us completely spotless and ready. What is he to do then? So he gives us yet another way to be completely cleansed of all sin and punishment so we are spotless and ready for heaven. And that way is called Divine Mercy Sunday. And on that day, the one day St. Faustina mentions in paragraph 699 of her diary, Jesus gives us something we call the extraordinary promise. He says, on that day, the soul that has been to confession and receives holy communion will receive complete forgiveness of not only all sin, but all punishment due to sin. This is incredible. So have you ever said, gee, I wish I could start over or I wish I could just clean my slate? Well, now you can. Jesus says on this one day, the eighth day in the Easter octave, that is Divine Mercy Sunday, the soul will never be cleaner. That is why Divine Mercy Sunday, Father Seraphim used to say, is like a second baptism. If we simply go back to the sacraments, the source of all guaranteed grace, all you have to do is go to confession sometime before Divine Mercy Sunday. It doesn't even have to be on that day, as long as you are in a state of grace, and receive Holy Communion on Divine Mercy Sunday or the Vigil Mass the night before. Again, just confession and communion. And when you do this, you will receive this incredible grace, this amazing promise from Jesus. But remember, this is not a magic wand or a rabbit's foot. As long as you have rectification of the will and you want to change your life, God will give you the grace to do it. St. Paul tells us this. Just cooperate with that grace. If you are homebound and truly you can't make it to the sacraments, just make an act of contrition, telling God you're sorry for your sins, and a spiritual communion, wishing to unite with him in communion, with the promise that you'll return to the sacraments as soon as possible, and you'll get the grace. Any Mass will do, even if it's not at 3 p.m. and the priest doesn't even mention mercy, which he should. (laughs) Okay, so people often ask us, why is this feast so important? Well, it's actually one of the greatest, if not the greatest feast. In fact, Thomas the Apostle said in the Apostolic Constitutions that we need a feast on the eighth day. And St. Augustine said it's the compendium of the days of mercy. He even said it's the highest of all the days. You know, on Easter Sunday, Jesus opened the door to heaven and that redeemed us. The door is now open. And as we said, the next seven days are symbolic of our pilgrimage on earth, searching for the promised land of heaven. Then once we get to the eighth day, when we die, and we enter into eternity, that open door that Jesus opened on Easter Sunday, we now actually walk through it. That's why this day is so great. And that's why St. Augustine said Divine Mercy Sunday is actually the greatest of the days. Now, it's not separate from Easter. As an octave, all eight days are celebrated as one day. So please, don't miss this grace. And I want to finish with this. When you receive Holy Communion on Divine Mercy Sunday, you need to complete the grace. So go back to your pew, kneel down after receiving Holy Communion, and make this prayer or something similar to it. 
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a poor sinner. Jesus, you promise, St. Faustina, that the soul that's been to confession, I have, and the soul that receives Holy Communion, I just did, will receive the complete forgiveness of not only sin, but all punishment. Jesus, please give me this grace. Jesus, I trust in you. And he will give you this grace, or Jesus doesn't keep his promises, and nobody is going to claim that. So please join us on Divine Mercy Sunday, which is this Sunday right here on EWTN starting at noon Eastern time. And we are especially excited this year because it is the first time since 2019, four years ago, that we'll be doing a live show with a full crowd. Praise be to God. So we hope to see you then. Now, speaking of praise be to God, let's hear the story of Melissa Coles, who chose life and then later, many years later, saw the beautiful fruit that came from her decision. I'd say I was rebellious a little bit. I did a lot of things I shouldn't have done. I think we all do that, though, as part of growing. Well, at 17, I moved out on my own. So I was living on my own at 17 years old. Now, what 17-year-old knows enough to be out on their own. That's naive. I basically moved in together with my high school sweetheart and we got pregnant and it was not planned. We uh, were in a situation where we would go a few days without eating and we would go to his mom's house sometimes just to, to get food and we didn't feel it would be appropriate to raise a child in an environment when we couldn't even feed ourselves, let alone a child. The quickest solution at that time was, let's go somewhere and get the abortion before it becomes a bigger problem. He had just graduated high school and he got a boombox radio. And yes, that's what it was called back then, this big old box with the cassette players. And we had taken that back to Kmart and we got approximately $220 back. So we took that money, put gas in our vehicle, and grabbed some food, and headed up to the abortion center. He's got the music cranked up, and we don't really talk much on the way up there. And um, we get into the parking lot, and he shuts the vehicle off. Seconds later, these two people from the clinic rush out to the vehicle. And when I'd gotten out, there was all of these people lined up outside this fence, and they came to me and they put a blanket over my head and I was being, you know, called names and people were yelling at me, some were pleading with me, some were praying that I not go in there. But this one lady stood out above everything. And I heard her say so clearly, your baby has 10 fingers and 10 toes, please don't kill it. And I tried to raise my head from this blanket because they had it kind of draped over my face like this and I couldn't see her and they pushed my head back down. I proceeded inside the, the clinic and they everything is rushed and nothing is slow. Everything's fast, 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 fast. You don't have time to think, you don't have time to process, you don't have time to ask any questions. It, it was just a horrible, horrible feeling. But I proceeded on back to this room with this nurse and we get to the room and she hands me a gown and she hands me this little white cup with this blue pill. She says, put this gown on, take this blue pill and lay back on that table, the doctor will be in. And I lay my head back down and I keep hearing that voice in my head, your baby's got 10 fingers and 10 toes, please don't kill it. And my head falls to the right again. And all of a sudden, I hear this man's voice and it was plain as day as I'm looking at you right now, and it says, get up. Get up. It's not too late. And seconds later, the doctor walks in. He comes in, he washes his hands, he puts his gloves on, he sits on this little silver stool, slides over to me, and goes like this, hitting the stirrups, and right as his hand brushed up against my left leg, I said, I can't. I set up, I said, I can't, I can't do this. So he stands up, he rips his gloves off, turns around, starts heading out the door, 
puts his right foot on the trash can, drops his gloves in, and never looks back at me. I so badly wanted to say to somebody, anybody, I didn't do it. I, I, I'm so pregnant. But I was scared, young, naive. So I just got in my car and we drove off. Still pregnant. So we're in the car and we get about halfway home. And I say, I didn't do it. And I hear, what do you mean you didn't do it? I just gave you $220 to go in there and take care of this problem, Melissa. What are you going to do? I said, what, do you, what are we going to do? It's our baby. So it was silent the rest of the way home. And we get home, and on my way home, I'm thinking, what are we going to do? I got connected with a social worker. So I told her my story. And I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And she looked at me, and she said, have you ever thought about adoption? I went home talked about it for a little bit, thought it over, spoke with the birth father, and we agreed that that would be the best route for us to go. I connect back with Rhonda, the social worker, and she connects me with the adoption attorneys that facilitated everything with my adoption. They tell me one day, they said, okay, we're gonna start sending you some dear mom letters. I go, what's a dear mom letter? And they go, these are families looking to adopt. Before I know it, my mailbox is being bombarded with letter after letter after letter. I wasn't looking for perfection. I was looking for someone that would do the things with him that I wanted to do, like going fishing. And one day I come home and there's one letter in my mailbox. So I rip into this letter and I start reading the story of the Scottons. And I read where she lost two, two sons and then her mom lost four children. They had a death gene in that family and they just, they couldn't have children. And I, I could feel her pain almost through this letter. And I just instantly fell in love with them. I had to let go to the mom that couldn't let go. And I talked to my husband and I said, okay, he's well, willing to meet, but he wants to bring a film crew to do this. And I said, I don't want to do that. And he goes, but babe, what if it saves even one person? Is it not worth it? God has got big plans for you. When the van pulls up, like I'm literally pacing my living room floor back and forth. Like I'm so anxious. I've waited 19 years at this point and I am going to hug my birth son since the first day he was born. I am going to see what he looks like. I run out and as he's walking up, I'm like darting out my front door and I just latch onto him and I didn't want to let go. After our meeting, I told him there was one more place that I would like to show him. And he said, okay. And we go to the abortion clinic and it's no longer an abortion clinic. It's now a medical center of some sort. Those few seconds, you would be standing here and I would have killed you. You would be here. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, I'm sorry. God keeps opening more doors and more doors. When people look at me and they go, well, what's your hope with life, Mark? It's for someone to choose life. Because every life, it's not just one life. Every life is a generation and multiple generations. So when you choose life, you're giving life to generations.
Well, thank you, Melissa, for being a great example for us of the importance of choosing life and seeing the many graces God gives us when we do. Now, let's meet another Marian. This is my good friend, Brother Jeff. Uh, I mean, that's a very good question because uh, growing up, I always wanted to be married, have children, and be a grandfather even. Um, it wasn't until I had a priest in one of the parishes I was going to that uh, needed a contact. He said, can I get your contact? Now this was another parish I was going to from the one I was registered to. And so uh, he needed my contact. I was thinking, oh, maybe he got me confused with my buddy that I went there with who said he was discerning for the priesthood. So I went over and I started praying and then I thought, wait a minute, this is my calling. And so I prayed on it, prayed on it. I went back to my house, sat down, looked at it, said, could I give everything up? Thought of the apostles when our Lord said, come here, follow me. So I thought, could I drop my net and follow him? And lo and behold, I did. That was for uh, the Boston Diocese. Didn't happen, however, they didn't reject me. But the vocations director said, I think you do well in religious order. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, I did my consecration to Our Lady. And I remember Father Mitch Pacwa mentioned something about when you consecrate yourself to the Lady, your life is going to change. And so I believe it's Our Lady saying, no, come here to the Marians. Yeah, it's funny because uh, before, I mean, I'm a convert, and at the moment of my, of my conversion, uh, I remember hearing the, or seeing on EWTN the Chapel of the Divine Mercy. Didn't know anything about it, didn't know the hours and so forth. Uh, and that drew me to the, the, the Divine Mercy uh, message. And then um, when I was really going stronger with my faith, um, we came up here for Divine Mercy. And it was my first time at a shrine. And there's something about this place that really hit me. I felt a good joy in it. Um, I came here like about a year later and I went down to our Lord's Grotto and I was seeing stuff about praying for souls in purgatory and who the Marians were. And then I was, there was an, like something in me, like who are the Marians and the, the devotion to the souls in purgatory. And so, yeah, that really drew me to the Marians. If you ask me, Earlier, I would have probably said the souls of praying for the souls in purgatory, which still is. I still love praying for the souls in purgatory. I do it every day. But they all have different different things that hit me, uh, like like the immaculate promoting the immaculate conception. There are people out there that don't know what it is or don't understand the immaculate conception. Uh, helping out with parishes when I went to go see our other uh, parishes, the, the the love that comes from the other parishes, the, the parishioners there, uh, and needing to get the message out to everybody. So, and also hopefully it'll be our charism is divine mercy, promoting divine mercy, and what is divine mercy? Um, yes, it's a it's a hard question to answer, but I go with all of them. Well, thank you, Brother Jeff. Now let's hear in Scripture about the very first Divine Mercy Sunday. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands at his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. On the first Divine Mercy Sunday, one week after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples in the upper room and establishes the sacrament of the reconciliation as a gift and a channel of his merciful love to repentant sinners. Indeed, in confession, we personally encounter the merciful Jesus himself as if we open our hearts in humility and trust. Our Lord tells St. Faustina, daughter, when you go to confession to this fountain of my mercy, 
The blood and water which came forth from my heart always flows down upon your soul and ennobles it. Every time you go to confession, immerse yourself entirely in my mercy, with great trust, so that I may pour the bounty of my grace upon your soul. When you approach the confessional, know this, that I myself am waiting there for you. I am only hidden by the priest, but I myself act in your soul. Here the ministry of the soul meets God of mercy. Tell souls that from this fount of mercy, souls draw graces solely with the vessel of trust. If their trust is great, there's no limit to my generosity. The torrents of grace inundate humble souls. Today, Jesus, I offer you all my sufferings, mortifications, and prayers for the intentions of the Holy Father, so that he may approve the Feast of Mercy. But, Jesus, I have one more word to say to you. I am very surprised that you bid me to talk about this Feast of Mercy, for they tell me that there is already such a feast, and so why should I talk about it? And Jesus said to me, and who knows anything about this feast? No one. Even those who should be proclaiming my mercy and teaching people about it often do not know about it themselves. That is why I want the image to be solemnly blessed on the first Sunday after Easter, and I want it to be venerated publicly so that every soul may know about it. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And please don't forget to get these graces on Divine Mercy Sunday. And please join us next week as we're going to start a special four-part series on the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So we'll begin next week with what happens at death. So until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>